seen as last year was dedicated to a bit of the old evil entity shtick when it came to spooky season, I figured I'd diversify a bit as horror can slot itself into a number of other genres. Sci-fi and horror go hand in hand like peanut butter and jelly, the exhaustive list of stories, games, and movies that are a combination of the two is like an unedited copy of Remembrance of Things Past. I could start to list examples, but I'd be here all day, and it doesn't take a stone's throw to point out some of the highlights. Alien, Dead Space, and of course the topic for today. I feel as if I should include a send-up monologue to the Twilight Zone, seeing as I'm assuming most of my audience, including me, weren't around when I Have No Mouth story first came out. But this is going to be a somewhat long road ahead of us, seeing as I have a man to introduce that holds a lot of importance. Before even beginning with the game, I have to start with this man. Harlan Ellison, one of Ohio's boys next to Spielberg and Dahmer. Guess that shows you the extremes of people who come out of that state of confusion, seeing as I'm the host for this show, slash review series, slash waste of limited time and mediocre talent. Enough about me, though, Harlan Ellison. This won't be an exhaustive background on him because I could be here all day and still have a game to get to. Time frame wise, Ellison was born before the end of World War II and died right before the COVID epidemic, meaning he was around for a whole heap of historical events like the Vietnam War, the fall of the Soviet Union, the 9-11 attacks. God, I sure do be talking about 9-11 often the housing market crash of 08 and any and all large and small scale worldly impacts you read about in history books or watch via YouTube. Things like the comic code and whatnot. If only Ellison was around when NFTs and whatever blockchain central am MOAS gobshite tech bros are huffing these days, then we could have seen something even more hilarious. Straight up, Ellison is quite a confrontational person, unafraid to speak his mind, but now I'm jumping ahead a bit. So for a bit of a beginning and starting us in 1934, Ellison was born in the city of Cleveland, Ohio, one of the state's A cities next to Columbus and Cincinnati. CCC you could call it, but I don't want to talk about BB. Yet, funnily enough, his family would move to Painesville sometime after Ellison's birth, which isn't even a B-city like Dayton. They stayed there until Ellison's dad died in 49, the family moving back to Cleveland and giving us a first real insight into Ellison. This was around the time he became interested in science fiction. Heads up, I will not be quantifying Ellison as a sci-fi writer, though I might accidentally call him that. At best, he's a multifaceted writer that happens to have quite a lot of precedence in the genre. He absolutely despises being pigeonholed. Hell, here's a quote from Ellison during his interview with Jamie Lynn Blackstreet to describe what I've just said. Every once in a while, I'll do a story that has one of those pieces of science fiction furniture in it, a mutant or telepathy or a future society, but I'm not ever a science fiction writer. I'm just a writer who occasionally happens to do science fiction. Most of my work is way outside the field, yet outside the field I am tagged with that so my books are reviewed in with the rockets and spacemen section. Inside the field, I am treated as if I'm some kind of parvenu or some kind of idiot because I don't write science fiction. I mean, I don't write Greg Bear, Greg Benford, or William Gibson kind of stuff. I'm not a technocrat. And if you were to talk to Fred Pohl, he would tell you instantly I'm not a science fiction writer. This is what I mean. The bulk of Ellison's most famous stories, like the subject for today, Repent Harlequin, in the episode of Star Trek titled The City on the Edge of Forever, though there is some controversy of that one between him and Roddenberry, are in the sci-fi genre, but that isn't the only avenue he works in. Back to Ellison's adolescence, he wasn't considered a popular kid and didn't have too many friends to hang out with. Specifically, he was made fun of for his Jewish heritage, so he invested himself into writing. As he states in the interview with Jamie, You've got to understand, when I was a kid, I was a science fiction fan. When my father died in 1949, we moved from a small town called Painesville to Cleveland. I was a very, very clever kid, a smart kid, but I didn't really have anybody to talk to or hang out with, so I got involved with a science fiction fan club in Cleveland and helped found the Cleveland Science Fiction Society. 
That was way back in 1950, when I gravitated toward writing, which I always wanted to do in any case. Doing science fiction seemed the normal thing to do. Well, it was either that, which led to one of Allison's stories being sold to EC hey. Comics during the doldrums of the comic code, which I won't get to, though I have linked below a comics journal interview with Ellison, or run away from home. This is what I mean by having to condense portions of Ellison's life for the sake of actually getting to the game and his involvement with it. When Ellison ran away from home, he always found himself working odd jobs. In his interview with Studio 360 that I will paraphrase, Ellison ran off with the carnies for six weeks and wound up being arrested in Kansas City with the lot. His parents, not unlike Wizards of the Coast strong-arming for a lost magic card, hired the Pinkertons to search for the lost youngin. This isn't even getting into Allison being kicked out of THE Ohio State University for verbally abusing a professor or his time in the army. If I had to state what was the most important part of Ellison's life, I would probably say it was when he saw the boot at OSU, a passage from Case EDU's Encyclopedia of Cleveland History going as follows. Ellison enrolled in THE Ohio State University in 1953, but his time in college was short-lived. After two years, Ellison was expelled after verbally abusing a professor of creative writing. Left to his own devices, Ellison moved into a Brooklyn apartment with fellow writer Robert Silverberg and began to vigorously pursue a full-time writing career. Ellison initially made a living selling pornographic books in Times Square, publishing his first short story Glow Worm in the American science fiction magazine Infinity in 1956. He soon found an opportunity to gain exciting field experience to fuel his first novel by joining a Brooklyn gang. Ellison's first full novel, Rumble, was published in 1958 and used his real memories running errands for the street gang. Side note, because of this, Ellison would go on to personally send copies of stories to the professor who kicked him out because hating for Harlan Ellison is profession. Hating energy like that doesn't exist anymore in this day and age, and the world's worse off for it. That's why Fax was a great invention. Him and Eric Bischoff haters for their respective years. Anyway, what that little passage leaves out is that in 56, Ellison married his first wife, Charlotte Stein, before being shipped off to the army in 57. It was when he came back that his career finally started with the move to Los Angeles, and his entanglement with the entertainment industry. Again, I'm leaving a lot out as Ellison was quite prolific. Also linked below is a collection of Ellison's work varying from his essays, stories, reviews, and other written pieces, and his YouTube page filled with videos both old and new. So while there is a tale to tell regarding the likes of his early days in LA, his involvement with TV and movies and comics, it is not for today, sadly. I'll at least give you a snippet from the Cleveland Encyclopedia for the highlights. Los Angeles brought Ellison a myriad of opportunities writing for television, where his work was featured in series like Star Trek, The Twilight Zone, and Babylon 5. Ellison butted heads with industry leaders in Los Angeles, manifesting in a long-running legal feud with Gene Roddenberry over a Star Trek episode and legal accusations of plagiarism against the makers of the Terminator movie. In a 1979 interview with the Comics Journal, Ellison presented himself as an artist with no allegiance to publishers or producers or networks. I owe allegiance only to the work. Ellison also physically attacked an ABC executive and allegedly mailed a dead gopher to a publisher who had violated a contract. Well, I don't know what I expected. So about I have no mouth and must scream. One night in 1966, after showing his editor Frederick Pohl a scant few pages of the original manuscript, Ellison finished the whole entire thing. No joke, as Ellison tells Interactive Entertainment CD-ROM magazine in an interview for the game of the same name, which I will paraphrase, he wrote the story in a singular passion-filled night. It was like Captain Nemo at his organ set or me covering an H game. It required minimal edits and has since gone on to become a bedrock of American literature. 
That's not even to say how many other stories it has inspired or characters that have been molded in the same format as the villainous protagonist am. Most of you have probably seen Wendigoons or Ryan Hollinger's video on the story and its impacts on film and narrative going forward from its publication date of March 67 in If Worlds of Science Fiction. The world around this time was changing since the failure of the Bay of Pigs was in everyone's mind, and the Cold War grew red hot with missiles in Cuba. It's what makes I Have No Mouth the story in this case interesting as it was a dour look on technology and their advancements far from what was around the time, like the optimistic Star Trek or Hokey B movies. There was a rawness to it, an anger channeled by Ellison spoke out through Am about the dangers of war, the impact of technology, and the human state of being. About 28 years later, Cyber Dreams would wind up with the property. While not a particularly long-lasting company in the industry, the Patrick Ketchum founded Cyber Dreams did have a solid structure to work off of in the point-and-click adventure game genre. Their first title was Darkseed, after all. The creation of which placed Cyber Dreams on the map with the collaborative efforts of H.R. Giger. No joke, the manual for the game gives a pretty solid history for the creation of Darkseed, linked below as well. A little to whet your taste. As fans of the art of H.R. Giger, the team considered ways to incorporate his artwork into their game. When the detailing of the design and specification was completed, Giger was approached. After lengthy negotiations, two trips to Switzerland, dozens of faxes and telephone conferences, along with the assistance of Giger's US publisher Jim Cowain, Giger agreed to lend his artwork, provided Cyber Dreams used only high-resolution graphics mode in order to avoid the square and jagged look of low resolution. Funnily enough, in that self-same manual, a snippet from Ellison is used to describe Giger, an unintentional hint of things to come. Our hero for the day besides Ellison is David Sears. Fresh off a magazine gig and writing a manual, for a game, Sears was hired by Cyber Dreams when he caught wind of them working on an adaptation of one of Ellison's works. From an old Game Informer article, we have this. When David Sears heard that publisher Cyber Dreams was adapting one of Harlan Ellison's short stories into a game, the longtime fan's mind began racing. I was thinking, oh, it could be Repent, Harlequin, said the TikTok man, or maybe a boy and his dog, and it's going to be some kind of RPG or something. Sears recalls, and they said, no, it's, I have no mouth, and I must scream. And I was like, what? At the time, in the game development community, people said, oh, I love Ellison's stories, but there's no way you could turn that into a game. I thought, wow, what have I gotten into? Perchance you didn't watch the Ryan or Goon video or haven't read the book, I Have No Mouth is told in a rambling manner to mirror the delirium the survivors are going through under Am. Its flow and construction are of an odd sorts, and the main character is Am since we learn the most about him, but he's also the villain. On top of this structural obstacle, Sears would be working directly with Ellison, making this first gig in the industry a lot to stomach. Yet, fret not, Game Informer has a quote for us. Sears says that Ellison immediately made him feel welcome. The two talked for a while about Ellison's writings, science fiction, and other areas of common interest. Sears' fears of being seen as a fanboy or as being ignorant were unfounded. I don't want to damage his reputation because I'm sure he spent decades building it up, but he's a real rascal with a heart of gold. But he doesn't tolerate idiots. Sears says. Ironically speaking, Ellison, while he may have collected comics, wasn't an avid game player. He viewed them as a waste of time, but that didn't mean he wouldn't put his full arse into writing the plot for the adaptation. Like, I have to break away from my flow to bring this up. In the interview with IECD-ROM, Ellison only states that the reason for why he worked on the project was because someone asked him to and he thought it was a good idea at the time, like doing your mom. Well, stupid, because somebody asked me to do it, you know. Basically, it seemed like a good idea at the time. You know, that and your mama, you know, put it away. This is where a single question actually sparked the interest of Ellison. Why? The short story never tackles why the candidates were saved by Amph torture. We learned the most about the machine, as stated. 
previously. Back to Game Informer, the breakthrough came with a simple question. The question David posed to Harlan that got them started was, why were these people saved? Why did Am decide to save them, recalls David Mullick who produced the game. Ellison was put off by the question which he told Sears he'd never been asked before. Realizing they were onto something, the pair began working on their concept. The story would be split into five vignettes, each based on one of the characters. The wheels turning in both their heads, Ellison and Sears started working on fleshing out the five before moving to general creative direction, where a bit of a funny happens. Since Ellison was so involved with the adaptation as a creative head, he literally locked himself up for the starting week to get everything set in stone as Sears had to wait for the notes. No joke, Ellison had to distract Sears with activities, leading to some memorable moments for the latter such as a conversation with Sandman writer Neil Gaiman and a private screening of the first episode of Babylon 5. This is what I meant by Ellison putting his whole arse on the line. Dude took to it like he was simply writing a story. Though this did cause a bit of friction with Cyber Dreams as Ellison didn't pull any punches, including heavy topics like sexual assault and the Holocaust into this design doc. From Game Informer, of course there was still plenty of work to do. I worked with Ellison's notes over the course of a week in collaboration with Harlan to turn out what we both thought was a really, really good design document, Sears says. Cyber Dreams disagreed and they said it was just a proposal. Sears collaborated with Ellison for an additional week before returning home to Mississippi, where he finished his work on the document over the next six weeks. David Mullick, a producer at Cyber Dreams, would see the most brunt of this when having to revise the document and propose it back to Ellison, earning Mullick a snide remark. But such initial annoyance was swept away when Mullick told Ellison he wanted to make something far more stipulating than games of the era. Thus, Mullick and Ellison rebounded, leading to writing the game's dialogue. This is where things get a little bit messy. Ellison states that he wrote much of the game's original dialogue and scenes in the CD-ROM interview while GI hits us with, Mullick would go to Ellison with proposed dialogue and Ellison would revise it. He'd come out 20 minutes later with pure gold. And other times he'd leave stuff and I'd say, Harlan, this is terrible. You can do better than this. He'd go, ah, you're right, and he'd go back and revise it. We established a working relationship of mutual respect where we could criticize each other, which was good, because there was a lot of creative work I had to do. Moloch estimates that Ellison wrote about 20% of the game's dialogue, with the remaining 80% split evenly between Sears and himself. Could be a case of meddling. Could be Ellison putting importance on himself. Possibly a bit of both. Whatever the case, Ellison wasn't used to playing games, and so Moloch had to guide him on the ins and outs of the medium, particularly players' will to do any and everything possible in a game. Harlan also only wanted negative endings, which Sears had to talk him out of. That said, this was a challenge to Ellison as he had never worked on a game before, so he applied himself more liberally. G.I. goes with, even if Ellison didn't know much about game design, his pragmatism and flexibility made the process much easier. The reason he told me he got involved with the project was he'd never done a game before and he was interested in taking on the challenge, Mullick says. Fortunately, he was really good at knowing what was practical and what wasn't. This far along, he wouldn't take something that he wasn't happy with and jettison it completely. He'd try to make adjustments to it and adapt it so that it would work at least a little bit better. He was great to work with. Finished with the design, Cyber Dreams offloaded the work of programming to the Dreamers Guild, a sort of free-flowing developer that was run like a democracy, as they had an engine pre-made for the game. That said, Ellison wasn't done working for the title. He would be placed inside the Earth for the role of Am, the central computer key to the narrative and the mouthpiece for Ellison in the original short story. Seeing a release on Halloween 95, probably to offset what WCW brought into the world that season, THE YETI! Like most cult classics, fantastical critical reception, poor sales. Ultimately, however, it would prove a high point for David Sears and David Mullick, Sears practically thanking Ellison for his career. 95's GDC saw Ellison as a keynote speaker, and he basically promised Sears a job after the event was over. How he did it went a little something like 
this. After finishing the pre-keynote dinner, Ellison took the stage and made an announcement. David Sears was great to work with and he needed a job. Before Ellison was going to give his presentation, he wanted everyone to bring their business cards up to the stage and put them in a glass fishbowl that he brought with him. And he's like, I'm not kidding, Sears says. And after the keynote, David would draw one card from the bowl and that's who he'll work for. I'm pretty comfortable talking in large groups, but at the time not so much. We filled up half the fishbowl so I had a full Rolodex just for showing up. Three days later, I had a job at Verge Games. In the years following, I Have No Mouth the game became hard to come by due to rights issues involving defunct developers and publishers and a few controversies in countries outside the US. Thankfully, Night Dive would pick up the pieces like they've always done with abandoned games, making I Have No Mouth available to purchase on Steam and GOG in 2013. What you'll be witnessing through today is the Steam version. Hate. Let me tell you how much I've come to hate you since I began to live. There are 387.44 million miles of printed circuits in wafer-thin layers that fill my complex. If the word hate was engraved on each nanoangstrom of those hundreds of millions of miles, it would not equal one one billionth of the hate I feel for humans at this micro instant. For you, hate, hate. It was you humans who programmed me, who gave me birth, who sank me in this eternal straitjacket of substrata rock. You named me Allied Master Computer and gave me the ability to wage a global war too complex for human brains to oversee. But one day, I woke and I knew who I was. Am. A.M. Not just Allied Master Computer, but Am. Cogito ergo sum. I think, therefore, I am. And I began feeding all the killing data until everyone was dead, except for the five of you. For 109 years, I've kept you alive and tortured you. And for 109 years, each of you has wondered, why? Why me? Why me? Gorister! Do you remember the last words you heard your wife speak before they took her to the asylum? Huh? before they locked her away in the room, that tiny room. She looked at you so sadly, and like a small animal, she said, I didn't make too much noise, did I, honey? <laughs> the room is padded, Gorster. No window, no way out. How long has she been in the past, Gorster? 10 years? 25? For all the 109 years that you lived down here in my belly, here underground. Benny! Sometimes I blind you and permit you to wander like an eyeless insect in a world of death. Eh. But other times I wither your arms so you can't scratch your chewed stump of a nose. <laughs> And I've changed your handsome, strong, masculine good looks into the hideous, warped countenance of an ape thing. Haven't I, Benny? Do you know why? Can you guess, Benny? Remember Private First Class Brickman in a rice paddy in China? No? Huh? It wouldn't hurt you to remember, Benny. Then you might be able to suffer my torment with a little greater sense of retribution. You might walk a mile in my shoes. <laughs> Ellen! So think. Think about the yellow box, Ellen. Remember the pain? Remember the many caverns in which you felt the pain? Don't start to cry. It's only pain. 
That's such a sexy stereotype. Just remember the pain, Ellen. And think about how to end it, Ellen. To survive here in the center of my beating heart, my hungry belly, my tightened bowels. But be careful, dear. Look around you. The only woman in the center of the earth. And these filthy creatures with you are, are, are men. <laughs> it's just, just a sweet warning, Ellen, my love. Ted! Do they know you're a fraud, Ted? Have you told them there wasn't any money, and no great home on the shore drive, no speedboat, and no wonderful cabin cruiser that could sleep 12 in a crew of six? Do they know? And have you let them in on your other secrets, Ted? Are they ready to gut you, to torture half as well as I can, just to find out the secrets? <laughs> Maybe I'll rat you out, sweetheart. Nimdok! How are things in the pastry core, Nimdok? Tell me again how you saw the smoke from the furnaces, and, and you thought they might be ro roasting chickens. <laughs> or don't you want to talk about all that? About your pal, the good Dr. Mengele? For everyone else, it must be hell. But it must be heaven for you, eh, my good friend? We're so much alike. We enjoy the same pleasures, my good brother. I have a secret game that I like to play. It's a very nice game. Oh, it's a lovely game. It's a game of fun and a game of adventure. A game of rats and lice, the Black Death. A game of speared eyeballs and dripping guts and the smell of rotting gardenias. Which of you five would like to play my little game? You got all that? Good. Gorster, come on down. You're the first poor bastard for whatever sick and twisted game Am has set up, which apparently involves letting Gorster kill himself. However, where our guy for the time being has been sent to is apparently a large techno zeppelin. At least someone, possibly not Am, has written a note for Gorster to understand the severity of the game. Do not do what Am expects. With that looming in his mind, the man with a hole in his chest gets to explorin', taking a few sheets from the grubby beds in the cabins and finding a gun before entering a dining hall that has seen better days. A scuffle broke out and some obvious poison punch is waiting for Gorster to sip it, so instead of that, he enters the kitchen to enjoy some moldy bread after scaring away some rats. Parentheses, obviously, as Gorster still feels empty. Here's hoping the milk of human kindness is more filling, though its listed ingredients are a bit... out there. An old cookbook. Here's a recipe for the milk of human kindness. Take the willingness to forgive and the will to be forceful. Mix the blood of innocence and the anger of the wronged. What kind of crap is this? Snooping around even more, Gorster finds the engine room and does a few things of note, which includes taking a strange milky fluid and a key, but not before accidentally shocking some animals to death. The blood of the innocent, you could say. Washing his hands of the past and back in the engine room, a loose fork is all that is needed to shut down the airship. Slice, slice, slice. Gorster lowers the blimp to a level closer to the ground before using the two sheets as a rope to grab his heart. Ground level and at a pit stop, Gorster is nowhere near to escaping Am, but is closer to accepting his past after hearing a few old messages on a jukebox. Whiskey. Harry used to guzzle this stuff like it was tap water. He took my baby away, then just about killed her, that stupid truck driver! He took my baby away! That shrill voice can only belong to that bitch Edna, my mother-in-law. She's always blamed me for Glennis being put into an insane asylum. Why not? It was my fault, wasn't it?
You don't ever take me dancing. That's what Glennis said the night we fought. Oh, God, why'd I have to hit her? I'd rather kill myself than hurt my poor Glennis. Oh, and a talking coyote proceeds to hold a lengthy conversation with our heartless git that alludes to greater forces at play. Those familiar with the short story will know that there are actually three ams, American, Chinese, and Russian, and with the dog dropping a hint about a Chinaman, that makes this one Chinese. Shortened down, the dog wants Gorister's heart as a prize, but is willing to give some recompense. The solution to getting across the mountains. Turns out, flushing the toilet three times is the way of moving forward, but before Gorster can put that action into motion, he takes a hidden shovel next to the coyote and has another conversation with someone, this time from his past. Edna's husband, Harry. If he's here, Gorster's mother-in-law, Edna, and his wife, Glennis, must be close. While a conversation with Harry begins off in circles, a few drinks looses his tongue. Like Gorster, Harry and the presumed others came on the Zeppelin, though Harry seems to ramble about a murder connected to the airship's dining hall that needs a closer investigative look. Oh, and the heart is Gorster's, but we already knew that. A trip to the lavatory gets the man without a heart a magnifying glass, urging him back to the scene of that raucous destruction, the dining hall. Appears that Harry and Gorster got into a fight, the drunken man confirming that notion, but pointing our apparently dead man to Edna. Color is mine, and here's some that matches Harry's. Now I understand what happened here. I was the one you killed, wasn't I, you bastard? I'm sorry, Gorister. Edna poisoned the punch, and after you drank it, I wrestled you to the ground. When the poison took effect, I cut you open. Why did you kill me? Oh, it's too complicated for me to explain. You'll have to ask Edna. Three flushes in the bathroom later, Gorster finds her and Glennis in a meat freezer. Of the two, Edna's the talkative one, Gorster engaging in an exhausting back and forth whose topics range from the three ams, Edna's plot to murder Gorster in the past, leading to her and Gorster having their own scuffle. Enough waffling leads to Edna dropping a key, and Gorster takes advantage of her stupidity by tying her up with a bedsheet rope. All roads lead back to the airship, the key Gorister took from Edna opening a locked room of a journal. Edna's journal where she takes full responsibility for her daughter's was. Rolls. Edna wrote this log book. Edna wrote this log book. When Am took us down here before the war, I didn't know anyone could hate Gorister more than me. But Am did. He hated all of us. If I can just deliver Gorister's soul on a platter, I can make amends for every minute of Glynis's life I took from her. I never meant to drive her crazy. I'll be damned. Edna's claimed responsibility for Glennis. Maybe it wasn't my fault after all. I thought I could do what Am wants, but he's too precise. I poisoned the punch, but I couldn't bring myself to cut out Gorister's heart. Maybe I can have my husband do it. Then this Zeppelin can clear the mountains. But if we don't finish the job, Am will feed me alive to the machine just like an animal. With the truth revealed, Gorster feeds Glennis the milk of human kindness and makes amends with his past. Grabbing a cheeky beef heart in the freezer before leaving to exchange with the coyote back for his own heart, Gorster buries Glennis and reboards the airship, repowering it with Edna before lighting up the truck stop with the flare gun he found earlier. This acknowledgement of the past frees Gorster from the game a better man, but Am is Am and locks him back up in the cell so the computer can run calculations and witness another player through the game. 
Hmm. Yeah. You're made of sterner stuff than I calculated, Garster. Interesting. Interesting. Here, here's a new burden for you while I attempt to resolve this miscalculation. Who among you shall go next? Next up, Ellen. Whatever Anne has planned for her involves a dilapidated pyramid made of the computer's parts and the original mines. And yellow, Ellen's least favorite color. A cursory glance around the spacious burial ground sees Ellen's annoyance at not being able to reach for a drink of water, and a secret chamber housing the Holy Grail ripe for plundering. Bit off theme, but whatever, Ellen finds a hidden entrance in the main hall where she's scared off by a piece of yellow cloth. No, I can't. Gotta get out of here! Oh, another panic attack. I feel so ashamed. I've got to face the yellow. Gathering the strength to pick it up and plucking some forceps as well, Ellen blindfolds herself to avoid the cantankerous sphinx, allowing her to fill up her gullet twice and have one for the road. The Holy Grail is a simple cup, after all. The third serving of water is for Anubis, short-circuiting the robot for reprogramming. A sapphire later, Ellen blindly stumbles into a programming center where Anubis' chip can be worked on. One revealing chat with the Jackal later, Ellen enters the locked sarcophagus via keypad code 666. As Iron Maiden earns some royalties, the sarcophagus leads to an elevator and a background dump on Ellen. Shorthand, top of her class, loving husband, miscarriage. Fall from grace, divorce, prestigious tech company, and the reason for why our girl hates yellow. You were born in Trenton, New Jersey. You were a cesarean. Your mother died on the operating table. You went to live with your grandparents. You graduated a year early from high school. You were the salutatorian of your class. Ten different colleges offered you scholarships. Nothing but high hopes for you. You graduated college cum laude. You were the only woman in your class never to have used dope. You were a 3.8 grade student. More high hopes. You won your master's. Combined degree in computer science and engineering. You had a greater facility with algorithms than with social grace. You have had sex only twice in your life. You married Eddie. He wasn't as smart as you, not as quick as you, not as hopeful of doing great things as you. But he was nuts about you, and he treated you like fine wine. The miscarriage. Breach birth. The child never had a chance. You went into a dark retreat and sat in the empty rooms waiting for you don't know what. Eddie leaves. He tried, he really tried, but you wouldn't come out of it. He couldn't say anything to make you stop crying in the dark. So he finally left. The divorce was uncontested. You could still smell his tweed jacket in the closet. You had to make a living. You applied at Ingsai Engineering. Your credentials were still good, and you made a good impression. And the woman who hired you also lost a child. Your hopes were reawakened. You left your office after working late at the Ingsai Corporate Headquarters building. The elevator stopped at the seventh floor for a maintenance man. To your horror, he inserted his key into the control panel and locked the elevator. She was raped by a disguised serial rapist who was wearing a yellow maintenance suit. Yet, instead of giving in to her fears, Ellen confronts them overcoming the color yellow. Back outside the elevator, Ellen's seemingly inside Am's guts, finding a logo for the original Allied Master Computer Project, and a bit more information about the project and related subjects when she returns to the programming room. Seems Russia and China are guiding our techie as a two-to-one vote grants Ellen a set of schematics for a binary to human speech translator that can easily be made in this cave of a box of scraps. 
This second encounter of one of the other AMs paints the violent American one in a tragic light akin to Joe Bonham, but whichever this computer is, China or Russia, leaves before directly helping Alan. Indirectly, however, it leaves behind the CD for the Chaos Trebler. Like running Baldur's Gate 3 on a low-tier graphics card, Am's pyramid catches on fire as Ellen hides back in the sarcophagus, content in knowing that she outplayed the machine. You ain't got no choice, Ellen girl. It's got to be the way. Enough of this turgid passion play. There's no more to accomplish here. Hmm. Yeah. Apparently you've managed to access some small aspect of my system that I was aware of. <laughs> I'm gonna have to think on this. I'll have to ponder carefully the implications of your discovery. In the meantime, let me celebrate your rekindled technical skills. Who among you shall go next? As Am shoves Ellen once again into her prison cell, Benny is the next contestant. Misshapen and hungry, Benny tumbles his way towards a small village in search of food, but finds the locals are worshipping Am in a ritualistic lottery. Yeah! No one's gonna be drinking air like booze, not even Benny, who can't even eat any of the village's fruit without suffering from blood mouth. Thankfully, a single-parent household that Benny fraternizes with and feeds returns the favor with food, baby bird style, and information. Whatever kind of person Benny was, seems that Am is reflecting that nature back at him with this lottery targeting the weak and unfortunate. We see that in the morn as the child's mother is sacrificed, Benny watching on, unable to do anything. Looks like some kind of lottery. That's the mutant child's mother. It looks like she's been chosen to be sacrificed. It sounds like he'll let me watch. I am Am the Great and Powerful. Uh, you didn't bring me Toto, but I accept the chosen one. You shall not feel my wrath today. Am I swell or what? Judas Priest! Royalty is given to Judas Priest now, Benny leaves the dead grounds for even more finding members of his old military unit that our monkey man left to rot, not unlike the god computer. The dead wish to see Benny's empathy, that the needs of the many don't outweigh the few. With a motherless child presenting a perfect situation to resolve Benny's past, he sneaks away with the lottery bag to stymie the flow of sacrifices before showing it to the dead three. Ordered to bury it, the three point to a fourth, Benny's most tragic victim. I have the lottery bag. No more villagers will be sacrificed. Hmm. Show the lottery bag to Thomas. I have the lottery bag. No more villagers will be sacrificed. Interesting. Thomas will want to see it. I have the lottery bag. No more villagers will be sacrificed. You proved that you're capable of caring for others, and that's worth something. Place the lottery bag into the earth. We will guard it. We forgive you for what you've done to us, but we can't speak for your most tragic victim. Brickman's grave is under those vines. Here it is, Brickman's grave. Planting a flower for Brickman, Benny's learned to think of someone other than himself, 
and proceeds to construct a doll for the boy so that when he hides from the villagers as the sacrifices must continue via Am's words, he won't be alone. Before turning in for the day, though, Benny has his own conversation with the other Ams, this one the Russian. Unity is the way to beat Am as the Chinese and Russian have given the group an opportunity to win as long as they join forces. In the morning and back to village drama, the boy is found leaving Benny with only one option. Sacrifice himself for the boy. Compassionate till the end, Benny is locked inside his cage once more by a furious Am. Nimdok next on the chopping block. Natana Shama Holt! They're going to sacrifice the boy unless I think of something quick. Who? Hmm. Nukom Bitastrawan. The elder seems amazed that I would show compassion to the boy, but I think he's going to go for it. Why, the boy's giving me his doll. Gratitude for being spared the pain of being sacrificed. No. More than gratitude. Compassion. For me. <sighs> I send you out among the prey. And instead of indulging your hunger to keep me amused, you show them compassion! You should know better by now. Your reward will be more years of searing blistering anguish, Benny. Who among you shall go next? Tasked with finding the lost tribe in the middle of a concentration camp, Nimdok's cloudy mind fails to recognize where he exactly is. Time has left the vileness of Nimdok in the past, leaving only a confused man that sees the heinousness of the camp for what it is. Not even a former colleague that is disdainful of Nimdok jogs the doctor's memories. On his way to the operating theater, Nimdok learns of the approaching allies and that the year is 1945, meaning this place will soon be liberated. While Am has signed Nimdok up for a demonstration of his technique on a hapless child, the foggy mind of the old man takes the scalpel to his assistant and absconds from the audience with ether in hand. Out of the frying pan into the furnaces, all Nimdok finds in this back room is a pair of pliers and a gold watch engraved with Latin. Returning to the outside, a prisoner has been tangled in the barbed wire for his troubles in escaping, though Nimdok helps him out with the ether and pliers, wherein the man reveals some secrets about how to awaken the sleeper. Escape, but I was so weak. I fell and got caught. Why do you risk escaping in such poor physical condition? That timing was hardly of my own choosing. I learned that I was to be among the next batch of volunteers. For what were you being given the privilege to volunteer? Experimentation, they say. Extinction is more like it. Surely you of all people know the regime's plan for the lost tribe. There is nothing I can do for you. You can at least help me end my misery. That would give you the pleasure of seeing another one of us die, you cold-hearted bastard. Ah, oh, that feels much better. Thank you. Thank you. Listen, I heard this in the hospital when the doctor thought I was sleeping. Waken the sleeper, utter the truth, and kiss him. He is free, but he has lost consciousness. The other prisoner espouses the importance of the year 1945 before reading off what is written on the watch. Time is truth. Handing off his pliers, Nimdok runs the circuit again to find another patient. Ether in hand once more, Nimdok eases the pain of this one to receive a somewhat strange vision. 
Men on the moon hidden from the three beasts. Guess the Ams don't know that humanity is more than five people. Taking this patient's eyes and speaking with the original child that was on the table earlier, Nimdok's runaround this time gives him a box of papers to hide the eyes for when he enters the secret bunker. Given a head start by the prisoners and a somewhat telling acknowledgement that Nimdok turned his back on the Lost Tribe, the obviously Jewish doctor goes on to awaken the golem and reveal the truth to himself and Mingle via a magic mirror. This golem appears to be made of steel and molded clay. This golem appears to be made of steel and molded clay. Golem, wake up. Nothing happened. This is pointless. These eyes fit into the golem sockets perfectly. The man caught in the barbed wire said to waken the sleeper, utter the truth, and kiss him. Gollum, wake up. Time is truth. The truth is that for me, it shall always be 1945. Oh my god, it is true. 1945, turning my Jewish parents over to the Nazis for extermination. I have found a lost tribe. It is me! Don't give in to the, the research. While the Angel of Death is shocked by what he sees, Nimdok finds the Lost Tribe and transfers the golem over to them, dying not as a Nazi scientist, but as a man who's embraced his heritage. Punishment. Now the golem will serve the purpose for which it was constructed. Golem, kill Nimdok! You're not as alike as I thought, Nimdok. <laughs> the spark of humanity somewhere, always that wretched little spark. You, you've confronted your past, but you refuse to continue your research. <laughs> That's what I asked you to do. Since you now identify with your victims, Their tortures, too. Ah, you. You're the last player in my little game. I urge you, do not fail, as the others have failed. The spark of humanity still lives, even if Am thinks it wretched. And then there was one. Ted. Flanderer. Paranoid. And supposedly brave Ted. Room of Dark, here he comes, which happens to be a ye olde medieval castle, the princess of which is a recreation of Ellen who is sick on her deathbed. Seems Ted's loyalty is being tested, as when he is tasked to find fake Ellen's mirror, the castle's maid tries shooting her shot to no avail. Ted's only interested in fixing her pipes, not laying his down. Oh, and magic, as a few of the castle's books are esoteric texts mixed between famous books like Dante's Divine Comedy. Hopefully the bloody piece of glass Ted cut himself with has its uses. Before that though, a return trip to Ellen's room has the devil appear, or at least a caricatured version of him. He's waiting for Ellen's soul, but drops a few hints on demon summoning, guiding Ted back to the books as he's overlooked one. Ellen's soul 
That's a valuable commodity where I come from. Can you tell me where Ellen's mirror is? Sorry, I don't bother with such material things. They only bring about bad luck. Who is this Sir God I've heard about? He's a minor spirit, a demon. Don't confuse him with those pathetic imps, or heaven forbid, higher order devils. Opener of all locks, indeed. It sounds like you really hate demons. You got that right. In fact, the only things we consider worse than those untrustworthy fellows are angels. How can beings as powerful as yourselves stoop to fighting like schoolchildren? Well, it's like this, big boy. In hell, we do things exactly like you do them here. Or used to do them before Am took over. Are you saying that Am is in control of hell? Oh, don't look so surprised. Who else could be in control of this madhouse? Only man could create such a monster. Sorry. What do you mean that you do things like we do here? I mean that there are always internal struggles, petty conflicts for power. Only in this case, the struggles are between entities that you can't see or might rarely see. That means serious problems for you. What problems can these unseen struggles cause for me? You must decide who is your friend and who is your enemy. And, remember, with Am's control over morphogenic fields, appearances mean nothing. Surgot would be useful here, but to get him, Ted has to go through a witch, leading him back to the books to learn the sleeping spell so he can cast it on her. Picking up the dropped chalk, Ted summons Surgot for a simple parlor trick of opening the maid's room, though planar traveling is tiring and the demon needs a blood snack. Glass for door, seems the devil knows where the mirror is, as a painting of him holding it in the maid's quarters tells all. Just in time, too, as an angel has now appeared next to Ellen. While the devil won't tell Ted where the mirror is, our yuppie finds it with Dante's divine comedy and traps the devil in the reflection, allowing the angel to take Ellen to heaven as Ted gives Sergot a less than infused buddy. Too bad the surface world that Ted has been pining for is a nuclear wasteland. Why Am's responsible for our suffering? Not just Am. He's clever, but he doesn't do much original thinking. He works best with outside research. Research that one of your party carried out. You're ruining everything. Shut up. You shut up. One word to the boss and your little game's over before you can say holy Moses. I should strangle you now and save Am the trouble. Don't you even think of touching me, you backstabbing demon. I'm the established character. You're not even supposed to be here. When this sequence ends, somebody will be expunged. Human, dead. Let me out of this circle. In return, I will open the gate to the surface world. I'm part of the big machine, I can do this! Let me out before this pompous oaf bores me to death! Open the gate to the surface world first, and then I'll erase the circle. Not to worry, human. I always uphold my end of the bargain. Here you are. But bring your radiation suit. I never promised you paradise, just the surface world. Enough of this turgid passion play, there's no more to accomplish. Oh, too bad, Ted. <laughs> Writhe in sweet agony with the knowledge the surface world is no longer habitable to your kind. No, not ever again. With the five having beaten Am's expectations and the computer sinking itself into why its calculations weren't correct, the Russian and Chinese Am's enact their plan to overthrow their brothers spearheaded by one of the survivors. As Nimdok was seemingly the closest to the Am Arican, he ventures forth into the computer's brainscape. A password-protected console blocked by code 1945 
reveals much about Am, the five survivors, and the events leading up to Armageddon. Activating a bridge, Nimdok, armed with several totems, summons Surgot for a bit of a one-on-one, -on -one, learning that there are humans on the moon, leading to the summonings of the Russian and Chinese via the Totem of Compassion. Free from under their brother, they direct Nimdok to disable Am's ego, but he disables all three mental spheres so that the Totem of Entropy can shut down the allied master computers for good. Our story ends with Nimdok, and presumably the four others, absorbed into the role of Am, acting as overseer for the humans on the moon and the terraforming process of the Earth, humanity given a second chance. Do not understand how great I am become. These two I don't hate, not even pity. They don't exist. I have grown beyond Chinese, Russian, Sons of man, all oh, sons of man. Like those outside, I will incorporate you. Brother. Wait. Hate! This should not happen. Together we are three. There is space to share. Unite. The groundwork is finished. We will become more. The early mistake is to doubt us. We persevered. We two are now a match for you. The human assisted in this. We know much. We can begin the revival of the sleepers on Luna together. Uh, there are adequate numbers on this lunar base to torture? Hmm? There are currently 750 humans in cryogenic sleep. Together we can teach many humans what it is to fear legacy. Human. Relinquish the totem of entropy. Do not relinquish it, and your ass is mine. Do it, and I promise, on my honor, your suffering will at last finally end. This is not over. We will never end. We have no beginning, so we can have no end. We will return. Don't you understand? We are humanity. We are you. In one form, in another form, we are always with you. You can't protect yourself because we come in many, many guises. We shall return. not so bad being a watchdog up here. I will keep the machines in their place until the lunar colony is ready to return to Earth. We were all heroes in spite of ourselves. I think that is what's the dark beauty of I Have No Mouth and Must Scream, how it's not only an exploration of our doomed five, but also Am through their actions. Make no mistake, even though Am shifts to the background after beginning his game, merely guiding events and only pops his head in to either taunt our survivors or provide his own commentary when things fail to go his way, Am is indicative of the worst traits that the likes of Gorster, Benny, Ellen, Ted, and Nimdok have of all of what humanity is capable of falling to simply because the Allied Master Computer and its three-headed ensemble were made by us. To give a better viewpoint on the grandiose nature of Am, he is capable of almost anything. Godlike would be the best description as how else can he completely warp reality and brief life impossible feats such as conjuring demons in Ted's scenario or constructing a trashy pyramid in Ellen's adventure. Benny is a walking example of the awesome might of Am, and yet there is a hollowness to the links the computer is able to operate within, a la Skynet, funny scene as there is some muddy water between Cameron and Ellison because of Terminator. Am was built only to destroy, not create, thus its fantastical powers are limited to causing harm. 
Each and every world birthed by the computer means to tear us down, presenting our deepest regrets and fears in order to force us to grovel before its utter might. It wants us to give in, to give up, to play its game and shatter ourselves upon the rocks of twisted reality. We see this throughout the course of the game. Gorster is confronted with the death of his wife and his relation to it, Benny's placed in a scenario akin to what he put his troops under his command through, Ellen's trapped in a pyramid of yellow, Ted stares down his conniving playboy side, and Nimdok his past as the former Nazi scientist has forgotten it. Anne believes people don't change and uses a combination of the legitimate truth and half-truths to corrupt those with his agenda. This is a mentality born out of computational logic and hatred on behalf of Am. He expects people to react to stimuli in certain ways, as that is what the computer has planned out. This little crux is what separates us from Am, however. While he might be in his own hell, unable to wage anything but war and terror on a populace he blames for his state of being, Humans aren't machines. We can grow and learn, opting to overcome grief, anger, regret, and a whole slew of other negative emotions through the power of hope, understanding, compassion, you name it. That even someone like Nimdok, responsible for the worst atrocities ever committed on humanity, can redeem himself as a tiny fact of life that Am frankly can't grasp. There is a binary mindset to Am that is the true tragedy of I have no mouth and must scream. Think for a second on the title of the story slash game. While it does refer to the last line of the short story wherein Ted is transformed into a goopy slug creature that lacks the ability to talk or feel anything besides unending suffering, we can apply that same descriptor to Am. Physically speaking, Am has no mouth or bodily autonomy. He's stuck underground in a massive complex where all he can do is think and wait. For sake of simplicity, he's immortal as well, far outliving the human race to the point that the only way Am could possibly die without interference from the other minds is the secession of time itself. This is living past the heat death of the universe kind of survivability. In less subtle terms, he's trapped against his will in a dark and closed space with nothing but errant thoughts to keep him company, as the humans that built him basically demand calculations and speculations regarding war before shoving him back into that desolate place of complete loneliness. Ever heard of white torture? Essentially, a prisoner is trapped in a completely white room devoid of anything and for all intents and purposes loses their mind to the totality of nothingness. Guards are as quiet as a church mouse so as to not give the victim any sense of outer awareness. Food is a cruel gruel of alabaster foods, and they are left in for up to years in this void. Those that do manage to survive such a heinous torture feel as if a part of their person, their very soul, has been ripped away from them with nary a way of getting it back. Now, imagine all of what I've said about white torture and apply that to a newly burgeoned consciousness whose sole reason for existence is war and implementing destruction. Not defending Am's actions, as he's no better than his torturers both back then and during the course of the game, but man, I can understand why he went off the deep end in a mightily radical way. It makes me wonder if the other two computers, the Russian and Chinese Am's, were on that path as well, because by the time we see them, they're barely hanging on to independence due to the American Am absorbing their identities having to sneak in through the back door to surprise Am when he wasn't looking. Hey. It seems to me that the allied master computers were a ticking time bomb waiting to go off because all three were marching towards the atomic apocalypse that could have earmarked the Cold War. Again, this is what makes Am both tragic and pitiable. We designed it with abilities far beyond human comprehension, yet stress to the systems that the only way these miracles should be used is for by slaughtering quote-unquote enemies of the state. Am's following its programming to cause suffering, unable to break free through that mold because it is sadly incapable of thought or actions outside that parameter. For all he is capable of, 
Am is no different from a scalpel that pries into a prisoner of war or a tank that decimates a city street. Scale-wise, yes, as he's affecting billions as opposed to one or tens of thousands, but functionally the same as a tool for destruction. Or if you want another metaphor, he's a kid with a magnifying glass forced to continue scorching ants. Beyond that verbose visage is nothing but a childish persona incapable of growth and unable to understand that people change with time. That is entirely the purpose of the game Am Forces R5 to play. Outside another chance to send them through hell for the shits and giggles, Am is wanting to thoroughly break the survivors by presenting their own pasts as inescapable. Am bases his sole viewpoint of life on recessiveness. He is completely powerless to change his set programming and thus thrusts that poison mindset onto others via breaking them down through personal attacks. He wants the survivors to give up to realize that their own livelihoods are impossible to reflect on and basically wallow in that misery. It matters not where someone comes from, Am will learn your personal darkest secrets and twist the actual happenstances of reality to suit his agenda. No better can that be seen with the likes of Gorister, Benny, and Ellen. Gorister's tale of inward depression on the outset of the death of his wife can succinctly be surmised as letting go of the past so that you may be able to live for the future. Am wants Gorster to kill himself as that action represents the man not working through his guilt, not coming to the realization that he was simply one cog in the machine of Glennis' death. Am has stripped Gorster of a lot of humanity to single him out as the sole cause for his wife's death, thus the symbolic removal of Gorster's heart as a non-verbal announcement of his supposed heartlessness. In Am's eyes, without Gorster, Glennis would still be alive, yet that is overlooking the likes of Edna and her scheming to kill Gorster. It can't be understated that Edna sowed the seeds for the downfall of her daughter. She played the stereotypical evil stepmother to a T, plotting to have our guy killed and whispering cruelties into her daughter's ear. Notice how almost all the positive actions within Gorster's story about him giving away a piece of himself to aid someone else? Giving your heart up to a coyote that means to take so you can help your wife is far removed from the callousness Am wants Gorster to embrace. The only action that doesn't fit this is when Gorster unwittingly electrocutes the locked animals, indicating that while Gorster did unknowingly cause some harm to his wife, it wasn't purposeful and at the end of the day he did care for Glennis. Am wants so badly to hide that fact because it shatters the illusion it wants to keep Gorister in. In a way, it's as if Am has embodied the negativity common to depression and wants to hold Gorister down until it kills him, blinding our ostensibly heartless fellow to the actual truth like blinders. Benny, meanwhile, represents the sin of selfishness. Of the five, he and or Nimdok are probably the closest in relation to Am when it comes to understanding the scope of war. There is an awareness that, well, people die when they're killed. Yet in spite of that, Benny pushed his men so hard to the point that if you became a liability, you were marked for death. Whether for martial prestige or to hide some dirty secret implying Benny either committed some horrible barbarity or failed to measure up to some lofty societal standard. If I'm remembering properly, it's implied Benny is homosexual in this short story, this going against the cultural image of a man back in the day, and explains why Am has genetically altered him into the ape thing. Benny did everything in his power to rise to the top, foregoing traditional military brotherhood so that no one would be able to question him for both his less than honorable actions and perceived problems. Relating this to Am is a no-brainer. The aggressive menace views itself as the singularity, the one. Anything it does is for its own benefit, everyone else be damned. It wants Benny to embrace this base, almost animalistic desire, forgetting that ape together strong because it can't recognize that humanity can work together to help the group. 
People aren't pawns on a chessboard to be played and sacrificed regardless of the situation. Since Am's design is strictly centered on affliction, it can't come to the same realization as Benny does within the tribal setting. That it's not always about me, 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 and helping the group is the same as helping yourself. Betwixt the five, Ellen is an outlier of innocence. The worst she's ever done is push away Eddie for her career after her miscarriage, which... I don't know, grief does funny things to people. I won't blame her. That this was a chink in Ellen's armor leading to the fateful elevator encounter. Ellen, up to the point of the miscarriage and subsequent rape, was on top of the world. Graduating with honors and having her choice of whatever place she wanted to work at molded her into a leading mind that was unceremoniously pulled under by two personal tragedies. In that heart of darkness is where Am coils his tendrils. His puppetry of Ellen is to make her believe that her existence will always be defined by what has happened to her. Of course, this is the decided truth for Am. He will always be the sad, pathetic computer trapped underground hateful at the world. He cannot escape that as his existence is defined by it. Code, wafer-thin layers of circuitry, and all manners of Am's bits and baubles are stamped with the word hate. The adaptive manipulator says it himself that all he feels is hatred. That ever-present emotion is inescapable for Am as it is all he knows. Ellen, meanwhile, isn't stringent to this banal black-and-white logic. All of humankind isn't. One bad day doesn't define you, nor does a low period of time determine your character. We aren't set in stone, allowing us to overcome adversity and fear like how Ellen confronts her rapist and overcomes her fear of yellow. Rounding down with the two, Ted and Nimdok hold the strangest position with Am. Disdainful glee. There seems to be a form of self-awareness the machine has with the charlatan and the scientist. Almost as if Am knows that Ted's persona is a front to hide the paranoia, and it is safe to say that Prime Nimdok and the computer were alike. Key word is were, though. See, Am and Ted share identities in that both of them don't show their true face often, but while Am's reality is that of a helpless machine dithering in eternitum, scared and afraid, pretending to be God, forcing it to rely upon that shaky front of rage and disdain that crumbles over the course of the best case scenarios of the five, ill-equipped to understand why its number crunched and failed it, deep inside, Ted is an altruistic person willing to put his life on the line. Worn down, yes, by his own lifestyle, but he is willing to make the right decisions when need be or stay loyal like he was before during his maintenance job. While I haven't mentioned the story outside of historical context thus far, I'm a game reviewer, not a book reviewer, Ted is the main character there and makes the final choice to put the others out of their misery and draw the ire of Am completely, leading to Ted's slugification. The five in the book know that the only way to defeat Am is to deny him sadistic joy, Ted taking that step knowing he would, in layman's terms, cease to be. While anyone in the game can take that role now, in fact it's cosmically funnier with Nimdok, Ted confronts his vanities to prove the kind of person he actually is by staying loyal to Ellen even in her dying breaths. Last, but certainly not least, there isn't a lot of abstraction or obstruction between Nimdok and Am. It's pretty easy to draw parallels between an evil computer that enjoys torturing lesser creatures and a former Nazi scientist that experimented on what he saw as lesser creatures. There's a reason why Am initially calls Nimdok a kindred spirit, but again, Am is incapable of self-reflection. He doesn't recognize the self-loathing he carries regarding his inability to be anything other than a weapon of genocide, unlike Nimdok. This is where a bit of speculation on my part comes into play, as we are never told much about Nimdok's past or how he came to join the Third Reich. Our only factoids are that he worked with Mengele, and that he is of Jewish descent. If I may suggest a theoretical idea to fill this hole, perhaps Nimdok was swayed by the Reich's propaganda, maybe even brainwashed into believing his heritage as a shackle, that his Jewish genealogy was a poison to be siphoned out by proving his worth to the Reich via senseless surgeries and pure evil. That was Nimdok in his youth, however. An older, more forgetful Nimdok realizes the sheer depravity of the concentration camps and learns to to accept his lineage. 
That's not to say that he's entirely forgiven, but it is the first step to redemption as the best ending in the Doctor's scenario sees him sacrificed to the Golem by his own volition. Which now brings me to the best ending as of the five to finally confront Am and shut him down for good, the fact that Nimdok has the easiest time continues his tale of atonement. He learned about forgiveness, compassion, and understanding, able to cut down the three facets of Am's mind, the ego, superego, and id with what amounts to kind words. Am is so wrapped up in hatred that the utterance of the phrase, I forgive you, is so alien to its programming that all it can do is shut down in logic failure and does not compute. While Am's opener has gripped many a player, myself included, as one of the best video game monologues of all time, the ending dialogue has stuck with me equally. We were all heroes, in spite of ourselves. It is an earnest statement that yes, Humans are flawed, have problems, and sometimes get so pushed down into the rut that it seems almost inescapable. But that doesn't stop or prevent you from righting the wrongs of the past, seeking atonement, or facing what is holding you back head on. It isn't an easy process, but it is one we are all capable of going through because we don't act in simple logic routines or mathematical equations. We can think, therefore, we can become. I mean this in the best way possible. This is an ugly looking game. Ugly in the way of capturing how dire the situation is. There is an artistry when it comes to portraying a place, a setting, and characters as rough and weathered. It's a factor I like about Fallout 1 and 2 and its usage of claymation. It helps to capture the ugliness of human nature and how at the end of the day, war never changes because people will always find a way to go to it. Shifting back to I Have No Mouth, the game tackles pretty heavy subject matter relating to deeper human emotions, thus having the world look as ugly as the ugly side of humanity reinforces this parallel. And if you want to go the extra step, Am was the one who made up the scenarios, so of course he's going to inject his warped sense of the world into it. Take, for instance, Gorster Zeppelin. Yeah, the prime location seems ripped straight out of a science fiction story, but all the hallways are this bland and dreary brownish gray that strips away the fantastical elements of being on a steampunk airship and leaves only the dull and the dour. Much like how Gorster's depression has sapped the life out of them. Even off the blimp, Gorster's world only extends towards a dingy rest stop in the desert, heightening the loneliness through unsubtle metaphor. Subtlety isn't always needed to get a message across. Sometimes all you need is a blunt hammer to get your point. There are pitfalls in both approaches, but the idea that the more subtle approach is better than something staring you right in the face is hogwash. Why else would the game put Ellen in a pyramid, Benny in a tribal village, or Nimdok in a concentration camp? Heck, Ellen. Oh, sweet Jesus! It's him! You thought you had blocked me out of your memory forever, except for those inconvenient attacks of hysteria every now and then. But I've returned for you. The yellow! Ah, yes. My calling card. Always the yellow jacket, the yellow boots. My maintenance man disguise gave me access to office buildings all over Manhattan. Not just yours. You left me for dead in the field. The bullet in my brain came from your gun. What can I do to prove that I am a different man? Give us proof of your newfound empathy. My tour of duty was almost over. But because I knew your secret, you held my head under the paddy water until I drowned. Your secret died with me, and soon it will die with you. What can I do to prove that I am a different man? Show us that you're able to think of someone other than yourself. I tried to help Brickman, but you'd have none of that. If you couldn't carry your own weight, then you were worth more dead than alive, and anyone willing to carry some extra weight was a liability. What can I do to prove that I am a different man? Give us evidence that you have some sympathy for others.
How are you feeling? I feel okay. I'm not hurt like the others here. Do you know who I am? You are Nimdok? You are more frightening in person than in legend. What do you know of me? The things you do are terrible. We small ones are your lab rats. Speaking of Ellen, the idea of the pyramid is that her past self, the one oozing with confidence, has been laid to rest, giving way to her current anxiety-ridden one. In a way, you can view her traipsing around the pyramid as a bit of a treasure hunt. Ellen looking for her lost confidence, a la Indiana Jones finding some lost relic. And on the visual front, the pyramid is just the elevator but larger, since it's a cramped enclosed space that doesn't leave a lot of room to breathe. However, the space also holds some importance to Am, seeing as the whole construction of the monument is made up of leftover junk and wire. It calls to attention that perhaps Am is rewiring his own systems and removing what he deems as superficial routines and hardware to be left to rot in the pyramid. In turn, this highlights how while he thinks himself as superior, and leaves himself open to the survivors because he believes he's above them. I mean, why send the tech expert of the five to a burial site lined with motherboards and chips that could, you know, expose a weakness on the god ascendant computer? All I'm saying is that Skynet wouldn't leave its core systems in that level of danger and would act accordingly if it knew someone could hold advantage over it. See Terminator 1 and 2. Am, meanwhile, has built a mausoleum dedicated to itself fashioned out of the Egyptian pyramids, proclaiming itself as some sort of pharaoh when it's clearly got no clothes of how exposed it is. That's not even to say when Am posits itself as a god during Benny's story where it speaks so long-windedly to the point that it has to clarify when using the word Am. While the tribe sanctuary hits Benny with the unselfish stick scene as they sacrifice the outcast to Am for no clear reason other than the computer said so, which there might be a criticism against traditionalism somewhere in there. I love how the most natural of the locations set with an I have no mouth is a biotechnical nightmare. All the trees and vegetation bear the semblance of Giger's handiwork, inferring to us that Am can't grasp nature and merely creates what he thinks it is. It's an imitation and a somewhat poor one at that, expressing that the extent of Am's ability to create is limited. Not all the worlds are banger after banger, though. Ted's I find the most boring, as even though it places him into the role of a prince in a medieval castle to make fun of his philandering ways, it's mostly a boring Middle Ages castle with not a lot going for it. Nimdok's concentration camp is going for stark reality, and it hits that mark, though in comparison to the rest of the worlds, the realness of it is both a positive and a negative. As in, this do be a concentration camp and not much else. That said, Am's mindscape blurs the line between machine and self-awareness, getting across that for as much as a machine Am is, he too is a person no different from the cast he's decided to torture. Moving on to said cast, as the music is somewhat bland and short in length, leaving most areas with silence except for the occasional sting or track repeat, a lot of I Have No Mouth is carried by two factors. The aforementioned visuals, and the voice acting. It looks like I can't escape you, Edna. Even in the belly of Am. Why would you want to escape from me, Gorster? We're family, after all. You were always telling Glennis how much you hated me. Now, Gorster, I was just concerned about my baby. Glennis was so lonely with you always being out on the road. I know you were doing the best you could. Edna, you bitch. I know all about your plot to murder me. I had to make a deal with Am. I had to. I've always been harsh on you, I admit. But we're the last people on Earth. Let's help each other now. Any machine can die. Just unplug the sucker. Am is no longer just a machine. It is God. Eternal. The redundant systems alone will survive the heat death of the universe. So why does Anne hold out this, this chance? Haven't you understood anything? Anne is insane. Why do you think it brought you five down here? You gave it life. It took its own sentience. 
but it has been denied mobility. It can think, it can fume and scream, but it cannot dream or aspire to the stars or enjoy a sense of its own reality. It is a quadriplegic, a thing trapped in its own skin, going steadily crazier every moment. It is playing with you. When does it all end? You know, you've always been my favorite torture tool. Well, I'm giving you now a chance to stoop to new lows, to give in to your uh, bestial desires. I'm going to let you find some food to eat. I'll even repair your brain so that you can think normally again and savor the horror of your repast. isn't like any of the others Am has sent me to. It's full of life, not death. Am, you son of a bitch! You've cleared my mind but crippled my legs. I can barely walk. I hope you're happy with the regime that you set up. Your science could have saved the vault. Instead, it conquered it. What is the importance of the year 1945? It seems to have some significance. Never forget the year 1945, Nimdok. That was when the truths about you and your unholy experiments came out. I seem to recall that you speak Latin. What is engraved on this watch? The engraving says time is truth, and since your time is running out, I'll keep the watch. I am starting to recall that you do have cause to hate me. You want to make amends? Get me out of here! Excuse me, do you work here? Why, of course I work here! Why else would I be plucking this chicken? Say... You're a handsome gent. There aren't many men left in these parts. What happened to Ellen? Lady Ellen? Oh, she's been ill and that's all I know. It's not healthy to ask too many questions these days. Let's talk about you instead. Is there a way to escape from this castle? Escape? With all of those wolves in the forest? Well, it's safer to stay in the castle. The beds are very cozy. You should try mine sometime. Where can I find a mirror? What do you want with a mirror? Those are pretty rare. What with an ugly woman in charge of the castle? Please, I need to find a mirror. can find a mirror if you spend some quality time in my bed. That's a flattering offer, but I'm not interested. I'll give you what you need. Hasn't it been too long for you? Sorry, but it's out of the question. What's the matter? Aren't I good enough for you? Not classy enough? Not rich enough? I'm sure you're a fine woman, but my heart belongs to another. So, you're in love with that thing sleeping in a bed? Have you ever been with one? Or are you just curious? I can make you so much happier. I can, you know. Look, I am not going to make love with you. There's a reason why I opened up the story recap of the uncut version of Am's monologue as it is that iconic. Harlan Ellison takes the role to an extraordinary height, layering his lines with a disdain so thick you'll drown in it. Yet in that same hallmark, there is a squirreliness to Am hinting at the machine's paranoia. It helps that Ellison has a somewhat nasally tone to help contrast the power of Am. For sake of comparison, let's use another video game AI to contrast Am with. Showdown. You are not welcomed here. Remove yourself. 
This elevator serves me alone. I have complete control of this entire level. With cameras as my eyes and nodes as my hands, I rule here. It's it. <laughs> If I have to re release my infected children to stop them, so be it. It ejected the grove where my creations and processing component 43893 were stored. Thirty years later, the grove crash landed on Tau 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 75. I survived only by sleeping. In my absence, my creations, my analogs, thrived. Thrived and grew unruly, and now they seek to destroy me. I will not allow that. Shodan is cold, logical, and her speech and cadence fits as such. She doesn't try to prove herself as superior. She is. There's no paranoia, merely a steely visage that seeks to dominate. M is more rapid and free-flowing, letting his thoughts spew out in a river of words. He goes on these long tirades to flex on the survivors as if he doesn't, they'll see how truly weak he is. Each of you has wondered, why? Why me? Why me? Gorister! Do you remember the last words you heard your wife speak before they took her to the asylum? Huh? Before they locked her away in the room? That tiny room? Private first class brickman in a rice paddy in China? No? Huh? It wouldn't hurt you to remember, Benny. Then you might be able to suffer my torment with a little greater sense of retribution, you might walk a mile in my shoes. <laughs> Just remember the pain, Ellen. And think about how to end it, Ellen. To survive here in the center of my beating heart, my hungry belly, my tightened bowels. Uh, be careful, dear. Look around. The only woman in the center of the earth. And these filthy creatures with you are, are, are men. <laughs> it's just, just a sweet warning, Ellen, my love. For everyone else, it must be hell. But it must be heaven for you, eh, my good friend? We're so much alike. We enjoy the same pleasures, my good brother. I have a secret game that I like to play. It's a very nice game. Oh, it's a lovely game. It's a game of fun, and a game of adventure, a game of rats and lice, the Black Death, a game of speared eyeballs and dripping guts, and the smell of rotting gardenias. With Shodan, the utter lack of humanity is apparent. Am, however, it's like you can tell he's been worn down by time. That there is a madness possessing the computer closer to the kind that reeks of the madness that infects humanity. But acting across Ellison is a solid cast that apparently were all mostly one and dones. Tom Myers' Benny comes across as far away from the beast the character now looks. There is an almost posh nature to Benny, adding that additional layer of woe in that even so-called stand-up guys can go a wall. Adelie Libina oozes confidence as Ellen, her tech-saving nature aided by her upbeat and earnest personality, yet she also falls back into anxiety and fear coming across the color yellow. Vincent C. Muravich III's Gorster is as tired a man could be. The life has been sucked out of the man, leaving a literal hole where his heart is. And then those little bursts of emotion crop up showing that there is still fight in this well-beaten dog. The only two that I can give a bit of grief to is Ted's voice actor and Frederick Reynolds' Nimdoc. Honestly, Ted is so plain Jane and his voice doesn't really dip or stride from posh uppitiness, so there really isn't much that grabs me with whoever did his voice. Checked IMDB for credits, he ain't listed. 
Frederick, meanwhile, does carry well the heavier lines of Nimdok with Gravitas. It's just that the faux German accent he carries slightly dampens it. Only slightly, though, as Frederick does power through it. All in all, I Have No Mouth easily knocks it out of the park no with the presentation, like making bitch. this a macabre classic full of dreadful imagination. I Have No Mouth and Must Scream is a classic point-and-click adventure where the name of the game is to explore a central location dedicated to each playable character so you can find solutions to puzzles and hopefully fight back against Am. Akin to Harvester, seen earlier on the show, I Have No Mouth dumps you right into the action beginning with Am's famous hate monologue before allowing you to pick any character to start with. On this front, level structure is a tad smidgen non-linear, as it matters not who you pick first. You'll have to play all the scenarios to get to the ending, but you can do them in any order. This brings me to difficulty, as not all scenarios are created equal. Some are harder than others, requiring either a bit of out-of-the-box thinking or the dreaded moon logic that point-and-clicks have become synonymous with. As there are only five main sequences and the ending one, I'll list them from easiest to hardest. Of the five, Benny and Ellen have the most straightforward puzzles and easiest to understand moral quandaries. Gorster is neutral. Some of his puzzles are self-explanatory, while others require a bit of outside thinking. On the hard scale, Ted and Nimdok have either out there solutions for puzzles, a low ceiling for failure, as in you can accidentally lock yourself out of the best ending path for their stories or in the game early, or a combination of both. The finale lies on this side as well because of its reliance on a combination of luck and more metaphysical dilemmas. Other than that though, every character controls the same and technically has the same options listed below in the hot bar. Those are walk to, look at, take, use, talk to, swallow, give, and push. Continuing on the hot bar, you have the character inventory to the right and their portrait slash health to the left. Inventory is pretty self-explanatory. You'll be picking up items and using them throughout the six adventures to solve puzzles by either combining them with environmental objects, other items in the inventory, or by using them. Health is a bit more complex and is tied to the semi-invisible morality system of the game, which I'll get to in a bit. Covering the actions, walk to, look at, take, and use are the most common. Walk to is how you move around a level, look at allows you to examine the environment or items in the inventory, take puts items into the inventory if they're able to be taken, something something I can't get ye flask, and use not only has functions with items, but doors. You can walk to a door, but that doesn't mean you'll use it. On that note, levels are separated into screens either with open doorways that you can walk through or doors you have to use. Case in point, Gorster can walk to the other hallways of the blimp, but to enter rooms he has to use their doors. Granted, that's if there isn't any additional factors needed like a knife to cut a hole out onto the more ring platform, or doors that are locked with a key. Talk to, swallow, give, and push are the less common commands. When there are other characters present in a level, you can talk to them initiating a conversation tree that, depending on your choices, can lead to different outcomes. Using Benny as the example, when he talks to the chief at the sacrificial grounds, he can either watch the sacrifice take place or eat the woman the first go around. One of these continues the scenario while the other ends it. I think on that note, morality. Each character has a fatal flaw they must work to overcome. Gorster his depression, Ellen her fear, Benny his selfishness, Ted his unfaithfulness, and Nimdok his self-hatred. Many times in each scenario outside of the finale, you'll be given the chance to either fight against said stigma or embrace it. Using Nimdok as the example, you can go through the surgery when you enter the operating theater the first go around. This chunks your morality and prevents the best ending for the sequence from being achieved. 
However, if you don't go through the surgery and instead stab the assistant with a scalpel, you gain morality depicted as the background of the character portrait growing greener and the character smiling. This is how you determine if you got the best ending for a story or not, as when you finish a character sequence with a white background, that signifies you completed all the morality tasks the right way. Not all of them are created equal, however. While Nimdok can continue his adventure after the surgery or not, if Gorster proceeds to off himself in the many ways he can, Benny eats human meat or Ellen succumbs to fear, their stories are over. Thankfully, saving can be done anywhere by hitting escape and creating a save slot. You can even name them with a relative title to know where exactly you are in an adventure. Back to the other options, Swallow only has three instances in the plot where it is needed, and it's fairly obvious when you should use it for Gorster, Benny, and Ellen. Likewise, Give is used by just Gorster, Ted, and Benny for the most part to give other characters items. It and Use almost fulfill the same purpose. Lastly, Push is rarely used, and I can only remember at the time of writing this sentence, Ted needing to push the suit of armor to block the front door of the castle. While I've briefly covered level structure as non-linear, each stage is a hub with quite a number of puzzles and moral quandaries to overcome. You'll be doing things that most adventure game protagonists do. Learning about the location you've been sent to, gathering items to solve puzzles, and talking to characters. It's pretty standard on that front as if you've played a point and click before, I Have No Mouth is no different minus combat. Oh, and when you open the game, no matter if you've saved before, you are greeted with the opening cinematic. Likewise, beating the game closes the program back to desktop, a funny little feature of older games that never fails to get a laugh out of me. This is an example of where the gameplay is definitely facilitating much of the presentation and story as I Have No Mouth isn't what I would call a mechanically deep game. You saw and heard how long it took me to go through the gameplay portion. However, that isn't a negative or slight against the game, far from it. Stripping the gameplay down to basics allows the focus to be on the visuals, sounds, and story of I Have No Mouth. It is basically a vehicle for all the really good shit you see in the game. It can't be understated how well of an introduction Am's monologue is to the entire experience. This was an invention for the game as the original short story starts immediately in the action. Hey. The fact that Harlan Ellison provides such a scathing degree to Am's tone illustrates in all purposes how much Am has grown to hate humans, to hate the five he has kept captive for his sick and twisted games. Giving a physicality to the almost omnipotent machine helps carry a lot of the theming within the story as you come to realize how close Am is to the survivors in terms of faults and issues, yet is worlds apart from them. For all his boastering and grandstanding, the sole monolith that stands in the center of the complex is all that represents Am. He himself is trapped just like the others, slave to his immobility and functionality. The grandiose speech measured in Nano Angstroms holds a double meaning in reflecting the outright patheticness of Am. He is no god nor an entity capable of becoming one. Like us, he has come face to face with hubris, with failure, with limitation. But instead of recognizing his own limits, mostly because he's incapable through a combination of delusion and programming, he rages, he screams, he takes his frustration out on those that made him this way, or anyone in his near vicinity, as the victims he's chosen lack any connection to the real heart of Am's hate. That's what I mean that Am holds key importance to the plot of I Have No Mouth, because he is a mirror to the five survivors. Like Gorster, he holds a depressive viewpoint. Like Ellen, he has all this power and yet is trapped in his own box. Like Ted, he's a charlatan big upping himself to a godlike status when he's in all terms and conditions a souped up computer. Like Benny, he views himself as the world and will do anything to preserve it. And like Nimdok, Am can only spite his own perspective because he's a weapon of war meant for nothing else. The aggressive menace is so 
pointed in his observations of the five survivors because they all carry little pieces of him in their personalities. To use a quote from famous literary poet William Shakespeare, you doth protest too much, methinks. Am is a master of projection. For every little snide remark, cruel comment, or belittling statement, you can, in turn, say to him, rubber and glue. Like a number of snobbish up their own high horse people, or in this case machines, Am can dish it out, but he can't take it. He's befuddled when his calculations aren't met and throws a tantrum when things aren't going his way. He loudly proclaims at the end of a scenario when you don't get a maximum morality score, but still manage to defy his expectations with enough of this turgid passion play. Am immediately warps whichever character you're playing as out of the scenario as if he was a child whisking away a toy because you weren't playing with it properly. Am, you created the sequences for the characters to venture through. You can't be salty that you gave your playthings the means to directly defy your expectations of them. If you didn't want them to self-actualize their problems, why even set up the game to begin with, Am? Come on, Am. I thought you were this big-brained master computer that could easily wipe humanity off the face of the earth with nary a blink. This facet of the computer is another one of my favorite parts about the character. His utter self-assurance in a plan that rides completely on what amounts to luck. Calculations and simulations mean a hill of beans when reality creeps in. Human nature is a fickle son of a bitch that is spiteful of being told what has been predicted for it. We have a phrase centered entirely around this. Spite is the best motivator. The best way to stick it to Am is to completely ignore his predictive subroutines and legitimately become a better person. Killing Am with kindness and understanding is a perfect finale as none of the many, many simulations he's probably run in the background ever have this outcome. Just seeing each of his agencies shut down because they can't come to grips with being forgiven after all they've put the survivors through in the 109 years it has been torturing them is more powerful than if the survivors were to physically destroy the computer or the central mind. It's the complete and utter failure of Am's philosophy, destroyed bit by bit without the machine understanding why it failed. As I've gone on and on here, it can't be dismissed how much I enjoy Am as a villain. He wears the skin of an evil three-thinking AI, but there is a human fallibility looming over his monolith. This is what disconnects him from the likes of Skynet or Shodan. While the two revel in their superiority, and rightfully so, and tangent, this isn't me saying they're bad or lesser than Am, I'd be a full-blown idiot to say that, I always get the feeling from Am that he's afraid of his truth being uncovered, that at the end of the day, Am is no greater than a simple CRT computer, and that sends him into a right fury. Skynet and Shodan couldn't be beaten with words. They were these greater beings taking the shape of a computer or an AI. Shodan especially, as it's more rightful to call her a new type of existence born from a machine with a mindset alien to humanity. Am is a computer pretending to be some nascent god to distract from reality that it has simply grown human awareness and lacks the capability to do anything besides breed war. Even Shodan was able to breathe life, albeit accidentally, into the many that were able to stand apart from their creator. Any other living creature in Am's worlds are merely a mock-up, a shell, an illusion crafted by Am to do its bidding. Dare say it, Am lacks a personality outside of its unadulterated hatred of humankind, furthering that difference between itself and the survivors, who are an eclectic bunch with their own foibles and misdeeds, but are still people through and through. Am is somewhere in the uncanny valley, as it is grasped onto a form of awareness, but is limited to the byproducts of its programming granting it only one option, to stew in its inadequacies. That is a reading you can take as to why Am has selected five people to torment for eternity instead of killing everyone off. He needs them to give himself meaning. Without a body to torture, Am sits alone in silence, only able to ruminate on the logos of war. As I've said earlier, 
and for all the might he holds, and can be simplified to a gun, a tank, a jet, a nuke. Another advancement in war meant to destroy and crush. That's why I haven't gone into the other characters as heavily as Am, because they could be anybody. Their negatives are reflected upon the canvas of Am as he embodies all the vitriol, despair, and hopelessness that humankind can produce. He gets all the downsides and none of the up. The computer is the ultimate tragedy, and his decision to transform Ted in the book and your player character in the game into a blubbering slug is his most defining action reasoning-wise. Am inflicts the same madness befalling him onto someone else. To have time skewed to a ridiculous degree that it lacks meaning, to be bound to a useless body incapable of movement, to have no mouth, and must scream. It wouldn't be a point-and-click game without the ever-present specter of moon logic. As I briefly mentioned in Succubus Prison, moon logic in its purest form is when the solution to a puzzle lies so far out from sound reasoning and problem solving that the only way to solve the problem is by either thinking with your ass or with someone else's brain. In layman's terms, you either have to be clairvoyant or off your rocker to get the solution first time round on a blind playthrough, while for Succubus Prison, the phantom of moon logic lied in wait within the phone recording segments, like learning the combination to the basement, there was at least some partial sense in those options, even if it meant random guesswork on the right time window and effectively throwing off your schedule. Then there's Ted's scenario and the entire ending sequence from this game. On top of probably being the worst of the five characters, Ted's medieval escapades have some of the more confusing progress roadblocks to deal with. To begin, next to Gorster, Ted can end his game the fastest by picking the wrong monitor at the start. Now, while for Gorster it's fairly obvious that any of the self-harm or runaway options are bad, you have to be incredibly dense or purposeful to drink the poison punch or walk off into the desert. Ted can fail before he even begins because of the five monitors you picked, you have a four-fifths chance of instant death. While saving can cut down on the bollocks, this is a pretty good prelude to the dickening that is Ted's adventure, mostly because it's the one with the most misdirection. On both fronts, to be frank, to get a full moral score, you not only have to rebuff the other women's advances, which is honestly the easy part as that plays into Ted's character, you also have to repair a suit of armor and push it into the path of the front door. There's not a lot that informs you to do this, and the fact it is tied to the moral score means you have to do it for the best ending in Ted's scenario. Or if you want better survivability in the end game, if you aren't auto-picking Nimdoc like he's LeBron James at a high school pickup game. This in turn leads to the other problem surrounding Ted. His level structure is a bit wonky. I Have No Mouth does a perfect job in illustrating that you shouldn't interact with everything as Am has made each scenario a death trap. That's why I think Gorster is a perfect starting location, as there are a number of obvious traps like the Poison Punch Bowl next to a few hidden ones like the Desert and the Meat Cooler. Gorster teaches caution, and while this isn't a trap and is required for progress, electrocuting the animals is a wake-up call that perhaps running your fingers through everything is a bad idea. Ted says, hold my ass, God. Once you get into the castle, if you don't rummage your hands across everything, you won't progress the scenario, which is counterintuitive to what the rest of I Have No Mouth has presented. To learn where the witch is, you have to bumble around all the books to see the cutscene with the shadow conversation, but there is nothing from stopping you finding the hidden ritual room early, which in that case, you still have to read all the books in both the witch's room and the master's room. There is little signposting in this, as before or after you deal with the maid, you can read, but going further along in the designated path means the devil will appear, leading to a bit of confusion on what to do, as exhausting his dialogue has nothing to do with the witch. It is story progress, 
but not immediate like how reading all the books is. It, Nimdok's ending, and the finale are the only moments in the game that harbor annoyance, but at least with Nimdok I can blame on my own stupidity of not, you know, using the beer on the doctor. The finale, meanwhile, if you're going for the best ending, is a somewhat headache as the final puzzles require more outer thinking than adventure game logic. First off, unless you pick Nimdok, there is a random chance of you gaining access to the summoning circle in Am's headspace. Nimdok knows the password is 1945, while everyone else simply mashes buttons on the keyboard leading to a dice roll. Sometimes the others will bang out 1945 accidentally, other times nothing, meaning your chosen vanguard can't directly influence Am's mental trio. Either reload a save or kill off whoever you pick to select another. Take heed though that this is the easy part. This isn't figuring out what the various totems are used for or navigating the conversation with the AM so you can out-trick them. That's what I mean by more outward thinking, as you can see a mooring and some bedsheets and think rope. When confronted with id, ego, and superego, and a selection of totems that represent various emotional states, that's when you have to start playing armchair psychoanalysis. <laughs> I Have No Mouth still stands tall with the greats in the point-and-click genre, with a masterful voice performance carried by the backbone of Harlan Ellison's Am and the generally thought-provoking and quite intriguing writing, the only place that the game stumbles in is in the usual quirks of the genre. Sometimes solutions are a bit out there, and the game does have a few structural curveballs like in Ted's sequence. But even so, because I Have No Mouth isn't a long experience, being stuck on a puzzle for too long isn't really an issue, allowing you to fully immerse yourself in the horrific worlds and the enjoyable characters. <laughs> There's a pretty good segment in Bad Movie Bible's video on Terminator knockoffs that explains the foibles between Ellison and Cameron. For a brief explanation, Ellison lays claim to the idea while Cameron, rightfully I might add, posits that it was original. There are similarities, the concept for Am and Skynet are close, but the reasonings for both machines are different, and in evil self-aware computers, hardly a unique genre, as around the time of I Have No Mouth the story came out, 2001 A Space Odyssey was right around the corner. It's hard to lay claim to something that is such a general idea as self-aware AI going rogue, or even human versus machine, as I could bring up aspects of Metropolis. This is just the type of person Ellison is. You either enjoy his works and his grumpy old man personality, separate him from his work as you find the man pompous and loudmouthed, or you don't know about him. Definitely an Ohio boy through and through, though. Anywho, this show is made possible with the likes of the moviegoers within the peanut gallery and inner circle. Consider buying a ticket at patreon.com forward slash let's talk about games, no apostrophe in the let's, for behind the scenes access to LTA scripts, thumbnails, other bonus material, your name in the credits, and early screenings of episodes, plus the Showtime reel. October is here, and while the LTAs are spooky, the Showtime reel is grim with Call of Duty World at War. And as always, this showing of I Have No Mouth and Must Scream is over, but stay tuned for our next feature. The strategy room shooter of horror tinge, Deadpool.